He first experienced acting inside a prisoner of war camp in World War II. That introduction eventually led to the Royal Shakespeare Company. And now Roy Dotrice is father in the contemporary fable, Beauty and the Beast. The show has become a cult hit with international fan clubs. When we recently spoke, I asked him what were his expectations before the show aired. The same as the critics. I mean, the same as the critics that, were, that said it, it could be the biggest no-no of all times. Because um, the pilot itself seemed to be so complete. It was like, a, you know, almost like a film. I mean, one saw where this beast man came from. Uh, we saw where Kathy came from. We, we, we saw her, him rescuing her. We saw father and how she had been mended and how she was befriended by the beast and how she fell in love with the beast and she wasn't appalled by the way he looked. And yet he, she had to go back to her own environment and she had the plastic surgery. And we knew it was a story of unrequited love and a love that ne could never be consummated. We thought, well, yeah, great, it's fine, but, you know, we can't have that every week. We've done it, you know. What are we going to do every week? That she's going to get in some trouble every week and he's going to come to her rescue every week. It's going to be so boring. But it hasn't worked out that way. It's, it's very strange how... And the credit of this is entirely due, I think, to Ron Kuzler, who was very imaginative and very creative and who wrote uh, the pilot. You were a prisoner of war in World War II. What are your recollections of that time in your life? Well, inside the camp was, uh, it was interesting because the Germans never kept us too long in any one camp in, in case we got familiar with the guards because occasionally we were in receipt of Red Cross parcels. And in the Red Cross parcels were things like real coffee, which the Germans hadn't seen for years. I mean, they, they, their coffee was made from acorns and stuff, you know, real butter and stuff, which could be traded for anything, escape gear, um, radio sets, anything, wireless parts. And so they didn't keep us too long in any one place. We were moving from camp to camp all the time. To me, the interesting thing was that even in a move, and you arrived in a, in a place which was just a, a massive barbed wire and a sandy soil and a couple of huts, within a very short space of time, and this is what I want to see developed in the television series, we got organized. You know, we, we, we found someone who could uh, uh, cut hair and we'd have a barber shop. We, we would find uh, someone who could make shoes and we'd have a cobbler's or people that could make clothes. They would make a, a tailor shop and they would uh, be making escape gear from bits and pieces that, so that, you know, if you were caught, as you know, if you're caught escaping in, in uniform, you can be uh, shot as a spy. But if you're caught as a civilian, you can get away with it. Um, and, and, and so there were lots of departments down there, uh, debating societies, um, theatrical societies, we, we had to entertain ourselves. But it was all very, very organized. And that's what I want to see developed in that underground world more. Uh, I'm sure the audience are interested in finding out how the people lived down there. There must be a sick bay somewhere. There must be a place where they bake bread. There, there must be a library. There, there, there's all kind. Want to see the activity? How do the children enjoy themselves? They're not going to sit in the dark tunnel forever doing nothing. You use uh, a crutch, a cane, mm. on, on the show, but that wasn't no. the original pilot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't in the pilot. You know, there was thought. It, no one's mentioned it actually because I, I was walking quite well in the pilot without a crutch, and suddenly in the first episode, I'm limping all over the place on a crutch. But w what happened was simply was that between the pilot and the uh, and and the series. The pilot I think we did in April, and the series wasn't due to start until July. I went back to England, and I had a hip replacement operation, because in 74, just before I started a big series, which was shown on PBS, called Dickens of London, which I played Charles Dickens, um, I fell into a swimming pool, which, alas, was empty, and I broke my hip, and I had to have steel pins put in because I couldn't afford to go into traction. And I did the series. Um, and, and then uh, the orthopedic surgeon said, you're going to develop arthritis in it, which I did. And uh, I suffered that for about eight years, and I thought, no, in the break last year, I would go back and have myself, you know, completely fit for the television series. So I had the hip replacement operation, which was immensely successful. And I'm obviously allergic to swimming pools because I went to a health club <laughs> and uh, a week out of hospital and slipped on a marble swimming pool and broke the, the femur, the thigh bone, right across the prosthesis. So, and this is like a week before I'm supposed to start television. And I thought, it's impossible, I can't do it. But they wanted me to do it, and they said, no, we'll accommodate you. The, the first few episodes will be very easy for you. You'll have very little to do, and you can just sit down or stand up and lean and do it, which I did. But as the legs got better, the parts got better. <laughs>